funny title choice, Disengage. It would have been the smart choice from both Captain Shaw and Raffi, as they both have good reason to do so. Avoid risking the lives of his crew, and because she was ordered to by her superiors, yet by the end of the episode both have gone against the suggestion and engaged the enemy instead, against unbalanced odds. First up I want to say what a spectacle Picard has been so far. The sets of Picard have been still darker than previous Star Trek series for sure, but I have had little trouble in seeing things unfold, neither inside the ships which have plenty of colour to break things up, nor in space which seems very well lit for a void. <laughs> Not complaining, I love being able to discern the action scenes. Speaking of, the dynamic entry of the Titan A was fantastic. With severing the tractor beam by warping into it, say what you will, that was an act worthy of the Titan name. Not bad for an exploratory craft. Small elements were maintained in the ensuing crisis, such as the attempted beam out, and I was worried that they'd forgotten about the transporter inhibitors, preventing just that. Established a, a scene before, but no, they remembered and addressed it, ironing out the potential issues before they arose so that nitpickers like me can get on with other things instead of being distracted by tiny issues, and instead focus on the unfolding drama. From the beginning of this episode, there is a question that is not answered until the end. Who is Jack Crusher? Riker speculates, we speculate, and Picard and tells him and us not to. This dismissal is understandable from Picard, considering for the majority of his life he has been alone, the occasional romance, sure, but nothing concrete. Picard is a man of duty, and I think that would extend to his family. So for him to learn that he may have a son who he was not there for is a guilt I think he would rather not confront. Also, I think there is still that element of him that is a little defensive when it comes to even his friends pushing into his personal life, and this is a lifelong reflex of his. Additionally, they were in a crisis at the time, and Picard probably did not want to bring added emotion into this when he needed his wits about him. I need this timeline set out for me though, because Ed Spelliers is 35 years old, and the oldest Jack can be is 22, so the chap looks good, don't get me wrong, but that's a big gap and I want to hear a canon age for the young crusher. It turns out Jack has had a long life of skirting the law and run-ins with various agencies and authorities all in the name of trying to do good. This has left him a wanted man and regarded as a thief, conman, and even collaborating with various governments or uprisings. Not exactly Starfleet material, and a far cry from Captain Picard, but with a brashness reminiscent of Jean-Luc in his youth. In some ways, he also reminds me of the Kelvin universe Kirk more than Picard. Beverly, too, is claimed to have changed a lot in the last two decades, and considering Jack's occupation and knowledge of Starfleet regulations, I'm inclined to believe her son's claims. Stealing and trading in supplies, firearms included, does seem a far cry from the Doctor Crusher we once knew, but it all seems calculated for overall good reasons. Eradicate a plague here, deliver medical supplies there, pay off people along the way to turn a blind eye. It all hints at someone that is still trying to better people's lives, just without the resources of the Federation behind them. The series has done a lot of that already, immersing itself in the edges of the Federation's life in both a geographical sense and a moral one. The systems we confront the Shrike in is beyond the UFP space. The world in which Raffi is immersed is one that still operates on currency and criminal behaviour, and Jack and Beverly have been sailing the cracks in the Federation's reach. That is even what elements like the Fenris Rangers were for. They emerged in the wake of a withdrawn Starfleet to patrol and protect the neutral zone, and in the wake of that withdrawal the galaxy has grown a little darker. Captain Vadic gets her big introduction played by Captain Vadic? Why did I write that? 
Captain Vadic gets her big introduction, played by Amanda Plummer, and I have to say I was unsure as to this character prior to hearing her dialogue. She is delightfully deranged. All manners and civility, with a playful glee that does little to cover her unhinged nature underneath. She goes to great lengths to explain the nature of the Shrike and why she chose it, and it could simply be herself she's describing. Some Shrikes are also known as Butcher Birds, because they don't just capture their prey, insects and the like, they then impale them on natural spikes for easier consumption. An accurate reputation and framed like that, I really would not want to see the crew get caught by someone who compares themselves to this. Right now she feels that she has the upper hand because, well, yes, she does. And I don't just mean the firepower at her disposal, but access to the personnel files and psych reports from Starfleet. I suspect an insider. And I'm hoping it's not Shaw himself. And this was all a ruse, I guess we'll find out. That's my wild well, stab in the dark theory. Speaking of stabbing in the dark, when Worf enters, he does so with the sort of flurry of efficiency and bloodshed that we're told Klingons bring to the battlefield with their melee weapons, but we never really have seen before, thanks to the keeping Star Trek of PG. His entry into killing all the guards around Sneed to extract Raffi also assuages concerns that just because Worf has taken on a more pacifistic approach that does not mean he's not a badass, or apparently even a complete pacifist now, considering he straight up murked about five criminals. I guess now we know what Captain Worf got up to, for sure after the Enterprise E, he took a ranking role in Starfleet Intelligence. I also appreciate the Klingon theme from the films here that was played over his appearance, except rendered in brass, giving it this noble feel which suits Wolf to a T. Sneed was played brilliantly by the way he came across as an experienced and dangerous criminal, holding back on his reveal until he was certain he had the upper hand. Shame it did not help him stay ahead. Rafi also meets with Jay, her ex-husband and Gabe's father, who adds to her character, and we learn it was her role in Starfleet, her delving into the Zatvash attacks, that led her down a dark path of paranoia and eventual substance abuse, which then had her cast aside. But it looks like this was something she always struggled with, maybe even coming from that life, considering her and Jay's familiarity with it. The conflicting priorities have her once more putting duty above her family, but Jay only sees her chasing leads that destroyed her, as it has in the past, and wants to keep that away from Gabe. Rafi is repeatedly sacrificing so much for Starfleet, and wading among the demons that she would have been better served avoiding. By the end of this episode, she's not only burnt bridges with her family, but has given up her sobriety at the chance of furthering her leads. Now, you can say that her hand was forced, and that is true, but it was still a sacrifice she made. I wonder how many others will be losing things for the sake of uncovering this plot. Picard seeing Beverly again, awake and for the first time in over 20 years, was everything I wanted it to be. The wordless gestureless meeting of their gaze across the bridge minutes away from crisis lets everything else blur into the background. The question in Picard's mind is evident to us all considering the constant foreshadowing, ensuring it is what is in our heads too. Is he? And her reply is equally voiceless, just letting barely controlled turmoils of emotions bubble beneath the surface and it conveys everything Picard needs to know that Jack is his son. This changes things for Picard, and to his credit, Captain Shaw too. Shaw was fine to allow a wanted fugitive to be handed over to preserve the lives of his crew, but the Admiral's son? That's a little too far, it seems, so the order is given to engage. Once more the series refrains from overloading introductions, with Beverly finally reuniting with Picard, but apart from that, Worf gets his first on-screen appearance. 
Again, I appreciate the gradual introduction of the characters. Having them organically woven into the story seems far less contrived, or for the sake of fan service only, which is a trap this season could easily fall into. So, speculation once more. I think Picard and Beverly are going to have to have a talk about things, but now is hardly the time unless you get a quiet moment in the nebula where they play hide and seek. Let's hope there are some Metreon gas pockets they can Riker manoeuvre in there. Anyway, I reckon, much as Riker seems to have pieced together, that Beverly and Picard may have tried for a relationship post Star Trek Nemesis. However, shortly after this, Picard was alerted to the Romulan supernova event and asked to head the task force, leading the evacuation. I think Beverly firmly believed that Picard needed to do this. There were so many lives at stake after all, but she was already pregnant with Jack and opted not to tell Picard, knowing that it would anchor him and take his mind away from the crucial role. So she ups and vanished, and it was not amicable. By the time the evacuation plan came apart in 2385, Jack would have already been five-ish. And by that stage, I can imagine the trepidation of her just rocking up and being like, oh, here is your kid, by the way. So far, I'm not sure what to make of him as a character. He is being the noble rogue, I think, and clearly cares for Beverly, yet he also seems to enjoy his reputation and this lifestyle. But I guess we'll see where he ends up. Thanks for watching this review of Episode 2 of Picard's Season 3, Disengage. I've been Rick, and I'll see you later for another one. Thanks again, and goodbye.